we are live. Welcome to the Black 2022's The Black Phone review and thoughts. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I watched this movie in a theater because where I live, COVID is under control. If you do not live in an area where COVID it is under control, please do not watch this in a theater. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself will be safe, there's probably someone you might ex accidentally spread it to that you don't want to spread it to. Now, that brings us... Yeah, I might touch my face at some point in this video. I washed my hands since last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before the next time I go outside. Now, this movie is rated R, and so is this video. Yeah, rated R for violence, bloody images, language, and some drug use. So, be aware of that for if or when you watch it. That Right, and this is my first viewing, but I'm almost definitely going to be watching this again. So, the plot, the year is 1978. It's not said during Halloween, but, like, I, I guess he felt that would be too on the nose. What with, you know, the terror to young people that wears a white mask... I think Scott Derrickson loves Halloween 1978 almost as much as I do. And to be fair, there's, you know, there can be only one, you know, it's, it's, a, it's lonely at the top. But, no, seriously, he loves that movie, and that's amazing. That was the year. Let's, let's see if I can get further into the plot. I already told you the year. We are in, I want to say it's North Denver. It's definitely Denver. Finney, a teenager, is bullied. His father is physically abusive towards his sister. And in Denver, there is this ongoing threat of a serial kidnapper. And that is, in fact, all I'm going to tell you about the plot before we get into the spoiler section. This is the review section with no spoilers. If you haven't already watched the trailer, don't, because it gives too much away. I, I'm not unhappy that I watched the trailers before, but some people have been, and others probably will be. So, the... Yeah, I, I forget if I actually put this anywhere in my notes, so I'm just going to say it here. This movie is not a horror movie from the start. It's essentially, it starts out as a coming-of-age story, you know. And then, over time, turns more into a horror movie. But at the start, like, the idea of being kidnapped, it's essentially, it's, it's one of the things that these teenagers talk about and, and think about. But it's not the only one, and it's, yeah. And, yeah, so, starting with the writing. So, the, yeah, this was written by Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill, who I really, I hope they continue working together, because they do some really incredible work together. And adapted from the short story by the same name, f written by Joe Hill, who is the son of Stephen King. I don't know if he changed his name to not have people constantly thinking, oh, that's Stephen King's kid. I guess he's going to be a great horror author as well. But yeah, this is this is some really good... I, I, I listened to the audiobook of the short story as well. It's excellent. No, no wonder it attracted them. Anyway, yeah, so Scott Derrickson and Roberts and C. Robert 
Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill together wrote the first Doctor Strange and both of the Sinister movies. And Scott Derrickson also wrote Deliver Us from Evil, Devil's Not, which he didn't direct. He also didn't direct Sinister 2, but that one was at least a sequel to a movie he did. Anyway. He wrote The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which he also directed, Land of Plenty, and Urban Legends Final Cut. I mean, I've seen considerably worse. You know, 2000s, not, not the year, but the, the those couple of years, slasher movie made for teenagers to think they're experiencing something smart instead of just watching a slasher movie. Th that sounds dismissive. I love slasher movies. Yeah, this is this is really excellently written. Not every character has a lot of depth, but the ones where it goes for depth, it really gets it. Like, every single character, you know, by the end of the movie, if you legitimately aren't sure about, you know, one of these characters, that's because you're not supposed to be completely sure. But the ones that the movie is trying to draw a clear image of, for a while I didn't think they were going to be able to do it, but yeah, they, they did. And... Yeah, the, the dialogue, the psychology, like, a lot of people don't know how to write, like, children and teenagers, because they don't really remember what it was like, the way that, you know, the way that you think in those years. So, yeah, it, it's, you know, we have a lot of movies and TV shows where, you know, kids don't look, think, or act, or speak like their their own age, but what some, you know, someone considerably older, uh, who has completely forgotten what that was like. And yeah, the, the, I, I don't know which of them it came from, uh, uh, which of the two. It can't have been Joe Hill, because he only wrote the short story, which is much, much... You know, I, th I think they did a really good job of expanding. Like, they added depth, and it didn't really... F I don't know. I guess I can... There's stuff that I could understand if they thought was, like, padding... Yeah. I'll, I'll get into detail in the, in the thoughts section, but... Yeah, the, like, everyone comes across as real. Like, there were actually, there were characters in this where I thought, oh, that's just, they're going to be, that's, that's who they are, I guess. And there's not going to be anything because we've all seen movies where teenagers are bullied or teenagers have this or that to deal with. So this is exactly how that's going to go. Okay, hopefully they'll put a fun spin on it. No, they 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 actually added depth to characters that were used to being stock characters. Once again, not everybody, but the ones that we are supposed to get a full image of. Now, this was directed by Scott Derrickson, and yeah, he directed Doctor Strange, Silver from Evil, The First Sinister. The Day the Earth Stood Still remake and The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And I am seriously considering, because The Day the Earth Stood Still is on Disney+, Plus. I think I might actually watch, e even though, like, I don't think I've heard a single positive thing about that in the 14 years that it, that movie has been out. But, I mean... He hasn't really hugely let me down. I even watched, before I was a fan of Scott Derrickson, I even watched the, the Hellraiser direct-to-video movie 
that he directed and I think he did a perfectly fine job like someone had to do that it was a small budget it was better than like it could easily have been a lot worse so now let's see. so yeah of the of the movies that Scott Derrickson has directed that I've seen I'm going to rank them worst to best keeping in mind I love all of them and I'm not saying any of them are bad Deliverers from Evil, Sinister, Doctor Strange, and I will update that list with this when I get to the end of the review. Honestly, Sinister would be at the top if not for, you know, above Doctor Strange, if not for some of the stuff with the ghost children. At the end of the day, I can't really claim, I, I can't really defend some of that stuff. And I can't really, like, the stuff. Doctor Strange is not my personal favorite, but it is one of the best MCU movies. Now, the the opening of the movie really does a great job of like this just like there's some tension, but it's not like serial kidnapper tension. We we actually start at baseball game with Finney and like his you know yeah the people of his age and it is legitimately tense but not in a like oh he's gonna die if he loses kind of way but just in like it matters to him you know it's it, there's a, there's some status involved and maybe there's someone that he wants to impress who might be watching, you know, and yeah, like, I, I'm really glad that it didn't start with a scare, because that is, you know, both sinister movies start with a scare. I honestly don't remember about Deliverers from Evil, and obviously Doctor Strange doesn't quite count, since it's not really a horror movie. You know, he likes opening his horror movies with scares. A lot of horror directors do. That's not a bad thing, but I really do appreciate that here. It legitimately is like this is this is something he cares about, you know. Yeah, and and it really does. It it sets up that this movie isn't only about the the threat. the The movie doesn't ever really let us forget that there's a serial kidnapper. But it also just, it understands that that's not the only thing these kids are, are thinking about, you know? And and really, when you think back to, like, if you actually remember what it was like being a kid and a teenager, yeah, there's stuff that you understood that could get you really hurt, that might even get you killed. But that wasn't the only thing you were thinking about. You were also thinking about friends and people you might be interested in, you know, various, so, yeah. And the opening titles do a really incredible job. I'm not going to describe them in detail. Just I will just say that they're incredible. So I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. But I would definitely say that it does fit with what came before. And I personally think the ending is basically perfect. I'm not sure I can think of anything that would really improve the ending. Okay, maybe one thing. I can only think of one thing, though. There is no... Uh, I guess that's a spoiler. I, I'll just say, I yeah, the, the writing for the ending is, is great. Now, I suppose I can't say for sure, but I, I saw online that there was no post credit scene, so I left before the... yeah. And I think you probably should as well. Now, yeah, so the, the short story is 30 pages or 51 and a half minutes audiobook. I recommend it, and the audiobook is actually here for free and legally on YouTube, so yeah, it's... it's, it's legitimately good, and I am not unhappy that I like listened through it before watching the movie. 
I suppose some people might prefer waiting. Now, but yeah, it's definitely, this is an adaptation that completely understands the source material. This is not just like, oh, you know, that's kind of a cool title. What, what's it about? Uh, whatever, we'll, we'll think of something. No, this is legitimately, like, I was very surprised. Both, when, like, when I listened through the story and I was like, oh, hey, that's in the trailer, that's in the trailer. And then, you know, have now, yeah, having listened through the whole thing and then watching the movie, it's like, wow, that was, like, I, there's some, there's some stuff that's, like, verbatim. And that brings us to the cast of characters. So, it is not a spoiler to say that Ethan Hawke is known as The Grabber. I love seeing him in another Scott Derrickson film. I, re I hope they don't wait an entire decade before the next one, because these are two of my favorite horror movies ever made. Yeah. I, I'm really, really glad that he moved outside of his comfort zone because he is absolutely amazing in this. Like, this legitimately, I haven't watched everything he's done, but he's been making movies for like, I guess, 30 years? Is that right? Yeah, because he was like, yeah, he made he was he was in movies when he was like a kid right or a teenager something like that and just yeah it's it's i understand why he doesn't usually play villains he said in an interview that he doesn't like inviting that kind of thing into his mind and i completely understand that you know yeah actually let me i have here from an interview he says he prefers not to play villains doesn't like in writing that kind of thing into his mind. But Scott Derrickson convinced him. And I can see why. And it really is. Like, I wouldn't have thought it. I really, like, if you, if someone, if, if, if I traveled back in time to before the first trailer came out. And I told younger me, Ethan Hawke is going to play like this real just awful like you just you terrifying I, I would not have believed it you know like even when he like even sinister sees him like going a little outside of you know and he's not he's not a villain in that he's not he's he's A bit on the hmm, amoral side, I think, is fair to say in that movie. And even that is like, you know, uh, you know, when you see his face, he's like, oh, you know, that's that's the good guy. A, yeah, I I hope that Scott Derrickson talks him into another one, not a sequel to this, maybe not even a spiritual successor, but just something else that they, yeah, because really. Like, there are things in this that are similar to Sinister, but, like, in a lot of ways, they are incredibly different. Now, in an interview, Scott Derrickson said that the way that the grabber moves, stands, gesticulates, and the voice are all Ethan's ideas. So, like... Ethan, if you are considering, like, I think you could build on this. I think you could play, like, a series of horrifying movie villains. Because you're, like, this is, this is some of the, like, he has better instincts for some of these things than, like, people who've been in the business from, for a long time. I don't know for sure. I, I can believe that Ethan Hawke doesn't like thinking about the, you know, like, yeah, pl playing, you know, to, to play a character like this, you kind of have to 
like he's invite the evil inside or something like that he says I can believe that he doesn't usually like playing villains but he must have been watching very carefully when other people play villains because this really is like absolutely incredible now the the movies that I've seen him in let's see I think I'm gonna go ahead and update this with let's see yeah so ranking from worst to best these are they're not I'm not talking about the movies overall quality I'm talking specifically about Ethan Hawke's acting performance in these movies once again ranking them worst to best I love all of them except Taking Lives so Taking Lives, Great Expectations, Gattaca, Training Day, Daybreakers, Assault on Precinct 13, Sinister, and The Black Phone. So there was this, like, yeah, when, when I saw him in the trailer, I could barely recognize him. At first, I couldn't at all. I, I was like, I, if for one thing, because Ethan, Ethan Hawke doesn't play villains. Like, you know, it's, it's like seeing... Arnold Schwarzenegger scrawny or something it just it's that's not that's not a thing I, I it's clearly I'm I'm mistaken you know but yeah went back played it again listen very carefully to the voice look very closely at the face that is him that is him in the and just yeah and Mason Thames I'm gonna go with the British pronunciation because I think that's right if not, dude, I'm sorry, you're incredible. Plays Finney Shaw and really, like, I mean, it helps that there's a lot on there. There's a lot on the page. Like, this is a character that really, you, you, there's a lot of detail to him. You know, we know a lot about, like, again, over the course of the movie, we learn a lot of things about him. So, you know, if you are a good actor, you can try to work all of that stuff into the performance. And he really, he, he absolutely nails it. Like, he's, this kid's a natural. Like, I've seen him in interview leading up to the release of the movie, and he's, like... In, in the movie, he basically lacks confidence. You know, he's he's a little... You know, he's he's smart, but he he feels... You know, he, he doesn't stand up for himself. And in interview, he really doesn't come across as someone who lacks confidence at all. And that is also, like... If you're an actor and you lack confidence, that's probably something you're going to need to... You know, to try to deal with. Because that's, that's a big problem. Yeah, he just, he really, he sells it. And Madeline McGraw plays his younger sister, Gwen Shaw. And she's like, she's, not you know like, like she's literally she must be like two or three years younger than him if i had to guess maybe 10 maybe 11 but like young and she is like she has a lot of guts she's you know if you mess with her she will cuss you out if you mess with her you know yeah don't <laughs> Yeah, she's 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 pretty badass. And again, like she really legitimately was the the yeah. Yeah, I'm going to read aloud a uh, fellow critic McGraw's contri contri contributions to the Black Phone cannot be understated. The fierce little sister trope may have become more common of late, but this kid's comedic timing is impeccable. She effortlessly 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 switches back, switches between snark, despair, and fear. I have had a lot of candy in, in my 
defense. You know, that, that for, for me, that comes with going to the theater, so. And, yeah, in interview, they talk about, uh, you know, McGraw and Thames talk about that they tried to hang out whenever they could between their scenes being shot. And they did actually get along in real life, and that really helps. Cause it, uh, within just a few minutes of seeing the two of them walk next to each other, it's like, okay, I'm convinced. These two have known each other their entire lives. Like, the, the, this is, they, they're so, like, there's, there's this sense of them, like, they're used to each other, but not in a bad way. Like, the, you know, they're, they try to help each other out and, like, encourage each other in, in ways that feel like, you know, it's it's not like cloy, cl cloying and saccharin and such. Like, I think I will, it, yeah, just briefly, this, you know, earlier today, the newest episode, uh, the fourth episode of Ms. Marvel came out. I love that show, and it's trying to go for something different. I do really appreciate that, you know, in that show, sometimes the the young people are very supportive of each other to a point where it may be, it's, it's not completely credible, but that is also more trying to, like, encourage people to be their best selves. This is much more a gritty take on, yeah. And Jeremy Davies plays Mr. Shaw. So, yeah, I, I really love his, like, yeah, once again, I'm going to be ranking the performances, yeah, his, his performances in all the things that I've seen him in where I can very clearly remember. So, worst to best, keeping in mind, I love all of them. The Black Phone, Secretary, The Million Dollar Hotel, and Lost. Now, his character, you know, Mr. Shaw, Jim, Jeremy Davies' character in this, is very abusive towards his children. I think it might be because the woman that he was going to marry actually left him right before the wedding to be with her abusive boss, not to mention all the stuff that happened to him on that island. And James Ransone as Max. I will never have a problem with seeing him in a Scott Derrickson film. I do understand why some people were frustrated with the character. Personally, I think maybe he should have just, like, he should have had a different role in this. Because really the character, there's just a, there's a couple of problems with the, the character. That's... Essentially, my only real problem with the movie is some of the issues that Max brings up. But, yeah. You know, this time, James Ransom actually, his character has a name instead of just so-and-so. And, -so. and I, I do kind of love that, like, in Sinister, he's Detective So-and-So. And that is basically, like, he, he asks, can I be Detective So-and-So? And then in the second Sinister... They explain very early on that he was, like, he's no longer a deputy. De uh, wait, did I say detective? I think I meant, de yeah, deputy. I think he's deputy. So, they gotta give him a name, right? Nope. He is former deputy so-and-so. So, yeah. All of his performances ranked worst to best. Keeping in mind, I love all of them. Black Phone, Inside Man, Sinister, and Sinister 2. I did see at least one critic say that he had too little screen time, and I do think, like, for sure, he could have had more, but I do also think, like, yeah, it's just, it's a character that doesn't really fit in with the rest of the movie. Now... There's a, a decent amount of diversity. You know, the some of the 
students are like you know there's a there's at least one Asian at least one that uh, I, I'm not 100% certain if they're Mexican or Native American but you know something in in one of those yeah and one of the cops is black so you know and and that is like I don't know 100% for sure about Denver but a lot of places around America you know it's not just a bunch of white people there is some diversity so the cinematography was handled by DP Brett Jutkiewicz and let's see yeah so his oldest credit as you know let's see yeah feature I, I believe that's a feature of a theatrical release was 2008 and let's see yeah so he also he also did ready or not which I heard good things about that actually yeah I don't really know any of these other right and he's also doing the the uh, that's because some of these notes I copied in back when I thought this movie was gonna come out a really long time ago because it's been delayed he did also DP the screen soft reboot Re requel I think they call it a requel in the movie that came out was that earlier that, that must have been earlier this year yeah yeah and at the time it was thought that this movie would be out you know last year I can understand why it had you know some of the delay anyway yeah the the cinematography is excellent like the 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 exact right amount of light and color is used you know it's not <laughs> given that we at at least one point in this movie see an an area where at least one child is kept after he was kidnapped nobody's surprised that that looks kind of dingy and, and nasty but it does take you know you, you do gotta know what you're doing as a DP to get that right and there's these I, I don't know how much I wanna give away about the nature of them I mean basically there are these short sequences where we see like something that happened to a young person and they filmed it like it's super 8 I mean it, I, I guess it's possible they actually filmed it with super 8 cameras in which case the cinematographer deserves even more respect for that I don't know it, I feel like it's probably easier to shoot it modern and just like run it through a filter but yeah for that you do gotta know what you're doing cuz you know nothing else quite looks like Super 8 which Scott Derrickson is clearly well aware of because by now this is the third movie he's written and the second he's directed where Super 8 film is important but yeah, like the the cinematography, you know, when when there is like threat and danger, the the camera will move faster or specifically be extremely still. And when it's just regular, you know, scenes during during the day, it's completely like yeah. He really understands how to create and build moods with the camera. And yeah, the editing was done by Frederic Toraval. And other than this, let's see, yeah, it's not a huge amount that I've seen that they've edited. But other than this, there's Peppermint, 
the first Sinister and the first Taken movie. So, and yeah, these are tremendously well edited movies. So, and uh, maybe actually, Peppermint might not have been well edited, but I do believe that was down to the the vision that was. But but yeah, I I. I saw some some critics say, "Oh, there you know there were shots in the movie that didn't accomplish anything." I have no idea what they're referring to. I I you know went in trying to find okay, what's the shot that no all of them really add up and just yeah. And you know once again, despite being stretched from you know yeah 30 pages 51 and a half minutes worth of reading material you know like there there are chunks of this movie that are nowhere to be found in the short story it really didn't feel like it was just stretched out it didn't feel like the other stuff was useless now i do understand if some people thought that some of it didn't add up, add, add enough, and I will discuss that when we get into the spoilers. So the effects, like this is not a super effects heavy movie, but the ones that there are need to work. Like, if we don't believe that what we're seeing, you know, and, and yeah, they, they work. Every single yeah and the stunt work is like I don't really want to think about how they did some of this stuff but I yeah incredible stunt work very very effective and the the movie has an incredible sense of time and space like I didn't exist in the 70s so I don't know exactly what it felt like, but I've read numerous critics saying this is exactly what the 70s felt like, you know, so yeah, and, and, you know, Denver never been, so, you know, the, the close, I, I was, hmm, I think, Think there's at least one person out there who does not want me to be too specific let I will I will say that I was in a southern state in America at least once and yeah you know so so I can I, I don't know exactly if this is you know what North Denver looked like in 1978 but it seems very credible to me. It's again, there is that grit, and you know, like at the end of the day, the moment that they stop filming, like to be sure, some of these places were like they actually found real places and just like you know made made it like they covered up stuff that didn't exist in the seventies, that kind of thing. But they legitimately did do like an like. It really transports you there. And that brings us. Right, the score. So, yeah, the. the um, it was handled by Amir Bengard. And, yeah, it's, it's incredible the the just this this you know for the the horror scenes these really dark oppressive kind of it, it really just i mean essentially it is selling this idea that you know we we are we are putting ourselves in the place of someone who has extremely little freedom and is is very scared of what happens next and yeah the music does an incredible job at, at that 
and let's see. yeah, there's some really great sound design on on some of the the horror stuff. Just wow, the 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 Foley guy had fun. I I hope uh, he either had fun or he had an extremely long difficult day, but it paid off because it's incredible. Now, this movie, without end credits, is an hour and 40 minutes long. And I think, yeah, if, if by the 30 minute mark you're not interested, I'm not sure the movie is going to change to, to something you would, yeah. So, the, the best element of the movie is the, the coming of age story. It's tied between the coming of age story, the the genuine heart that the movie has, and how unbelievably terrifying it is when when it really goes for that, which some people will wish it was more than it is. Yeah, I uh, thinking more about it. The worst aspect is almost definitely the character of Max for reasons I will get into in the spoiler section. And yeah, so other people, the worst aspect according to others, it seems like a lot of people didn't really, like they expected one thing from trailers and such, and they were very unhappy with what they got. I mean, I can understand being frustrated. And for sure, the trailers do not go off the trailers. They are... It's a difficult movie to, to really advertise properly, you know, in a, in a two-minute trailer. So, so yeah, it, it, it kind of sucks. That, that's one case where, like, at the end of the day, the elevator pitch for Sinister, you know, it's, it's right there. Like, it's, it's yeah, and, and for this one... I mean, it might seem like the elevator pitch, but yeah, I will talk more about it in the spoiler section. Now, the thing I was most worried about was the, the, there are some goofy aspects of the supernatural elements in Sinister 1 and 2 and Deliver Us From Evil, so I was a little worried that that was going to show up here. And to me, it didn't. Like, I, I think at least one person in the theater laughed at something that wasn't supposed to be funny, but yeah. And I was most looking forward to the reunion between Derrickson and Hawk. So yeah, the, the, the trailers definitely give away too much, and it is... Um, it is it is a movie that's really difficult to to advertise, especially in the in the two minute kind of thing. Five to ten minutes, you know, but that's not really how we do trailers. And let's see. right, and the the cover. And poster don't really give too much away. And yeah, so the on Rotten Tomatoes, this has an 84% based on 180 reviews and a 90% audience score based on over a thousand verified ratings. Of the 180 reviews, 152 of them are fresh. The average rating was 7.10 out of 10. That is, in fact, certified fresh. So that's pretty badass for a horror movie. That's, yeah. And the, the average user rate, verified user rating at least, was 4.4 .4 out of 5. So, yeah. And on Metacritic, it has, let's see, 
65 out of 100. Also known as generally favorable reviews. And that's based on 36 critic reviews. And the audience score is 7.6 out of 10 based on 38 ratings. And on IMDb, there are 157 you know, links in the IMDb external reviews section. And the current score on IMDb is 7.4 out of 10, based on over 12,000 IMDb user votes. So yeah, the 26.8% of the votes went to 8 out of 10, 25.2 to 7, 14.7 to 10, 12.4 to 9, 11.2 to 6. Yeah. Very popular movie. Now, the movie is... There is a bit of violence. I'm not sure I would really say that this is a movie... Like, if you love... If your definition of a good horror movie is a very violent, bloody, and gory horror movie, I wouldn't really say this, you know, this this might not live up to what you want out of that kind of thing. I would say that the violence always has an impact on the audience, and that's something I wouldn't say of all of the most you know, violent and gory movie. Like, The Thing is one of my, 1982, The Thing is one of my favorite, not just horror movies, but movies in general. I wouldn't say that all of the violence has an equally strong impact on the viewer. With this movie, like, yeah, there was not a single, every, every single time there was violence, I could, I could feel it. It was a visceral thing. And just, yeah, that that's something the movie does an incredible job of. But yeah, if you know, other than that, if that's not, I, I know some people who need for you know, if if there's not a like massive body count, if you don't have like Tom Savini special, but you know, Tom Savini did work on this, but he made the mask. He didn't. I'm I'm not sure he did any. Yeah, and I don't think I need to say since it's yeah it's it's not one of those horror movies that has a lot of sex or sexuality either <laughs> some people apparently were bothered by the swearing and you know depending on who you listen to this either absolutely nails how you know young people swore in the late 70s or it completely misses but i the the ones that the ones that said that it got it right seemed more credible to me. Like, it just seemed like the other ones were people who didn't actually know or remember that time and were like, that can't be right. And that's how a lot of people act when someone... Yeah. Let's see. So that was violent sex, swearing... Right, yeah, the, the drug use will also bother some people. It's not, like, there's not that much of it in the movie. Now, I definitely recommend reading Outlaw Vern's review. Although, do note, you know, he, he spoils the movie and, you know, he swears and uses other mature concepts in his reviews. But, yeah, it's it's a really solid review. I don't think I've ever read a Vern, Outlaw Vern review and been like, eh, that wasn't really worth my time. And that brings us. So, yeah, I recommend this to people who like coming of age stories and the the kind of horror that this dips into so you know it is this thing of like it's 
you know they're not living in the the this inner city crime ridden area so they should be safe kind of thing you know they they are living in the suburbs but there's you know there's still something threatening there and just this thing of like being a child or a teenager and adults don't listen to you don't believe you when you talk about the things that matter the most to you you know that kind of thing yeah so yeah I ultimately I guess yeah this I rate this eight creepy kidnappings out of ten and yeah so the worst to best of Scott Derrickson directed movies that I've watched keeping in mind I love all of them deliver us from evil the Black Phone, Sinister, and Doctor Strange. Ultimately, it doesn't completely... It comes extremely close to being as good as Sinister. But... The... Yeah. That is it for... The... So that, yeah, that brings us... That's it for the review. That brings us to the thoughts. Which is where... Get into spoilers, and I am just going right here. There we go. So the there we go. Yeah. So this first notes taken while watching. So. The, let's see, yeah, this, this section is thoughts about how while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And, yeah. I really appreciate it, like, the, the, it legitimately did feel, you know, impactful there at the start with the baseball game, you know, and and we really did like. I started to believe that he was going to be able to throw three strike balls, but yeah, and you know you have that bit where he's like, you know, yeah. So she's her apparently her name is Donna because. Grace makes fun of Finn. I'm going to call him Finn because that's what he says at the end of the movie that he wants to be called. Or maybe that's just Donna. I don't know. I'm going to go with everybody should call him Finn. So, yeah. You know, Grace teases Finn when, he, you know, he gets Donna as the, what was it, the la lab partner? Lab partner, I think it's called. Yeah. You know, at first, you know, he's, he's, you know, about to throw the ball. So he looks over and, you know, you see Grace sitting there and, you know, like she's, she's hoping he'll get, and, and he looks over and Donna's like looking intently at him. Like it's, and, you know, the, the third ball isn't a strike. It's a home run. And, you know, he looks over at Donna and Donna's already walking away. You know, she's, you know, just, yeah. You feel bad for him. I, I really appreciate that by the end he did get, you know, he got more confident and he got to spend more time with her. I really love that after the, oh right, I also want to, yeah. So the yeah the baseball game ends, and Bruce like he doesn't have to you know you you see the all all the kids 
you know, the the kids from the one team and the kids from from the other team passing each other. And I was saying, good game, good game. You know, they they have to because otherwise they, you know, it all in the area are gonna get mad. So they got, you know, they don't really mean it. They're they're like, you know, one one of them's like relieved they won, the other one's sore they lost. They don't they don't want to be doing this. But then Bruce does, you know, you you gotta. Your arm is mint, I think. it's. I, I really should be able to memorize it by now, because he says it like seven times over the course of the movie, you know. If I end up... Okay, I'm too, I'm too old for the grabber, obviously. But I... I don't know, I just... If I were a teenager who had been, like, kidnapped... And then killed, and and I was able to communicate to this kid who's caught, and trying to escape. I really like to think that I have something cooler to say, but I'm joking. This is my way of dealing with heavy to topics. But yeah, the you know he didn't have to say that to Finn, but he did, and Finn is a little you know happy, and and Bruce is riding his bike home, and, like, the girls are nosing him because he won the game and, and all this stuff. And free ride plays, which... Because, yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's period appropriate, but it's also, that's kind of how he feels. Like, he feels on top of the world, you know. And then it, like, contorts into this dark music, and we see the black van... And we, you know, we don't see in detail the kidnapping. We only see that when it's Finn. But, yeah, you know, he actually... With, within seconds, it goes from this, you know, on top of the world, happy, cheery, to him being kidnapped. And then these opening credits with, you know, con conveying, you know, the the people becoming afraid of the grabber and, and this whole thing. The fact that I don't think that Finn actually said the word, the grabber. No, he's not. He's not here. He's behind me. Isn't he? I can't do that because I'm looking right at the screen. I, I can see exactly what the camera is showing. Anyway, yes, the the. Um, I don't think Finn actually did say the grabber before he got grabbed, which was the thing that he you know he was like oh but if I, if I say it I you know. So so I like that little bit of yeah. I also, I really like, you know, she, the, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the, mm, yeah, you know, when, when, you know, she's trying to reassure him, but she dips briefly into accidentally, you know, she, she calls him chicken and then she immediately apologizes. Because that, like, she's used to being harsher when talking to other people, but not with him. So you know, I I love that little because that's the thing. You know, if you like, if most of the time when you're talking to people, you talk in a certain way. You know, like I remember when I when I made some friends who like to swear, so I started swearing too, and then I got home to, you know, my father has come around on the the subject. I don't remember if my, I think my mother hated harsh language until she died. But yeah, you know, I come home and I, I'm casually swearing. I'm not like telling them, you know, I'm, I'm not like using it in a, in a aggressive way towards them, you know just like yeah this is already a video yeah yeah the the there's a little bit of there is some swearing in the movie and i already said you know the video is rated r so yeah you know i would say something like 
today at school was fucking great, you know, and, you know, it's, it's not like I said, fuck you, or where the fuck is dinner, or something like that, you know, but just, yeah. Yeah, I, th I thought that was a great little moment. And the, you know, I, th I thought they did a really great job establishing that they never do call him anything other than Mr. Shaw, do they? I'm gonna go with, yeah, I guess I'll call him that too, yeah. So, you know, Mr. Shaw is, is sitting there hiding behind the paper and, you know, Finn is like, let's oh, see, is it drink? No, I think he's, he's like eating cereal. And he's like, <laughs> and, and the, the newspaper comes down. Do you think you could slurp a little bit louder? I don't think they heard you. I forget what the other place was calling, you know, and up comes the newspaper. And then, you know, Grace come, yeah. wait, is it Grace or Gwen? I feel like it's, huh, uh, the sister. I'm going to go with uh, Lady G. Lady G comes in and, you know, she like, let's see, I think she, is she getting bread, I think, in one of those, and that's also a great detail that they have one of, it's yeah you know so she accidentally drops the and and you know down comes the newspaper lady g what are you doing you know and and up comes the, and and she apologizes and then like the the you know she she makes eye contact with finn now that their father can't see them and she's like ooh and he can't he has to stifle a giggle and says yeah Again, you just, you, you learn so much about their relationship. And I really like that when the first time we, is it the first time? I think it might be the first time that Finn and Lady G are headed home. And she's like talking about who, you know, first she's talking about who the other girls in her class want to marry when they grow up and then she moves into the subject of who she wants to marry when she grows up and it's all these like celebrities that they know from tv and and such and i just love the like finn just you know without without making like a big deal out of he's just like you're not gonna marry someone from the partridge family you know and just Cause that's what kids, yeah, you know. I mean, I'd like to think today, you know, enough girls believe that they can be more than just housewives. But yeah, 1978 in in Denver, yeah, I'm sure, you know. Again, I'm I'm guessing she's about ten. That was probably what they talked about, you know. You know, they, they don't, like, they almost talk about it as if it's just, it's not really a question of if, it's just a matter of who, what celebrity will they marry when they grow up. You know, just, yeah. And we see a fight, and, you know, some of the kids are chanting, and no one tries to stop it. Like, Finn and Lady G leave. But ultimately, they don't actually, yeah, and, and just the, like, this detail that the, you know, basically the, the big guy is racist. He, he uses a racist epithet that I'm not going to be repeating against the uh, Robin his name is Robin took me a little while to learn but they said it enough times in the movie and Robin like there was like this brief part where you were like oh wow is he actually gonna come out on top because 
the other one's so much bigger, but he's he's got the moves, he's got the, the training, he's got the confidence, and so he actually, right, her name is Gwen, not Grace. So the, yeah, you know, the, the, and, and later in the bathroom, he's like, I was just going to, you know, this, but that doesn't draw a lot of blood, and you do want to get the crowd on your side, and so just, yeah, you know, he, w once the guy's down, like, the, for, for, like, maybe a second, you're like, that's it, like, fight's up, nope, he's gonna keep, and, and he just, he draws so much blood, and then later he goes into the the you know the the bathroom, rinses off the the, the blood, and he's like, "Oh man, his teeth are so sharp. I was bleeding from first period." You know, just yeah. And yeah, we see that Finn and Gwen are close, and in class, like at baseball, Finn looks at Donna and the moment that Donna realizes that you know someone is looking at and tries to look for you know immediately he just looks back because he's too nervous to yeah and Robin protects Finn from the bullies in, in the bathroom and just the the uh, what was that gonna yeah, I I really thought that worked well, like the whole, you know, basically Finn hopes that if he just gets far enough ahead of them, maybe he can hide out in the bathroom. And then they say, we know you're in here. And he thinks maybe things will go better if he just comes out instead of like hiding in there. And maybe, you know, he, he probably figures... That's just going to make them angrier. Maybe I can, you know, yeah. And he's rescued by Robin coming in. And we find out that, you know, friends, at least in part, uh, yeah, Finn helps Robin with math homework. And they talk about movies. And Finn never gets to go to the movies, at least not for R-rated movies, but Robin, what was it, his uncle, yeah, and we also find out that his father died in Nam, and yeah, and that's also great, because we only find that out after he's dead, you know, and he's, he's saying, you know, that's why I don't, you know, I'm, I, no matter how long I lived, I was never going to abandon someone, and I'm not abandoning you just because, you know, I am dead, and the, uh, what was the other thing with the, yeah, I mean, basically, if he's been without his father for years, you know, the, basically, he's been taking, you know, he, yeah, he's been fighting off bullies since he was little. Or, yeah, for, for years, certainly. I love the scene of Gwen cussing out the the cops. And, you know, he even, like, it's one thing that she's doing it to the cops. The principal is right, you know, and she's like, Gwendolyn. Yeah, and, and like, I saw someone say, you know, fart knocker sounded better. I don't know. I th I thought it worked, and and I do think that that is something they would have said back then. And let's see, what was the other? Th oh, right, I was gonna. Yeah, I haven't watched the original Texas Chance. I haven't watched a single Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie yet, so I can't speak to that one, but I can definitely vouch for Enter the Dragon is an amazing movie. And Finn stays up late watching a horror movie, and there's like blood coming out of a faucet, blood 
filling up in a bathtub and then an arm comes up. I'm, I might actually have to look up this film. It looked pretty cool. And yeah, and, and you know, Gwen is being beaten by their father because the, you know, she shared a dream and yeah, you know, and, and Finn can't quite stop it, but he does really sympathize with her. That was legitimately like, that was an, that, that was a really uncomfortable scene. I think they did a, a really good job of like, the scene didn't go on for longer than absolutely necessary, but it also didn't like it. It felt like a there. There was a presence there, you know. It it actually, like this is the kind of thing that's happened before, and if not for the events of the movie, might happen again. And yeah, Robin is kidnapped off screen and. And, and Finn asks Gwen to try to dream something that'll help get Robin, you know, back out of... Yeah. And she, like, prays to, to Jesus. That's, that's legitimately sweet. And, you know, she, she opens... Let's see. I think it's like a, it's like a dollhouse. Because her father isn't going to look there. And she has the New Testament. And she's got, like a cross, and there's at least one more thing. I think there were four things in total. And just, yeah, you know, and she's like, if you can give me a vision that'll, that'll, you know, help me, you know, yeah, I think she says something like, my brother really needs his friend. And she says something along the lines of, if you do this, I will believe in you forever. And, you know, the, the father comes by, and so she, she bolts out and, and hides under the covers. And then she runs back, amen, and, you know, back into the, you know, it was, it was funny, but not in a way that distracted from the scene. And, yeah, now with Robin gone, the bullies attack Finn, and I kind of like that, like, when we saw Gwen heading into the fight for like a second, I actually thought, oh, I I guess he's going to be okay. But nope, because, you know, there's three of them. Okay, you know, she manages to take out one of them with the rock to the and, and he just sits there and blood pouring down. Just, yeah. And, and, yeah, you know, one of them is able to kick her right in the face and she she's also bleeding. She's so just, you know, she's she's out of it. She can't, she's out of commission. She can't keep fighting. And they just keep beating him up. You know, I, I saw one critic saying, you know, this is... You know, this, this is a world where a fight doesn't end until blood is drawn. And... Yeah, so the you know the lab partners are being you know selected, and Finn is like looking around for someone, and Donna walks up and she's like, what? I th I think she asked, do you need a lab partner? And he starts up by saying no, and he says, I mean, I don't have one right now. You know, it's. Pretty smooth save. It was. It, it could have gone a lot worse, you know. And yeah, we've just been told, you know, you're gonna be sitting next to your lab partner all year, and so it cuts to, you know, Gwen and Finn walking, and and she's teasing him about uh, and just yeah, it, it very. Very strong sibling energy there when, you know, she's imitating them talking and making kissing noise. I, you have my word. I am not going to try to, to replicate that. This, yeah, but that was, 
it, it really felt in, incredibly real, the, the way that they told, yeah. And I gotta say, it was very chilling when I realized this is when this is when Finn gets kidnapped. You know, the, the I, I think, yeah, he just said goodbye to, you know, his sister is going to sleep at this, you know, his friend's house. And, you know, he's supposed to be taking care of dad, which, you know, that that's also such a great, like, you know, someone's got to watch him because he gets really drunk in the evening and, you know, like, yeah. And we see the, the we see the van and we see Ethan Hawke and just, and I do really appreciate, like, It would have, you know, it would work. It would really lower your guard to see this guy, like, you know, he... It's one thing to, like, drop things, but some of what he dropped broke. Like, he was carrying, like, eggs, you know, and one of them he picks up, like, oh, would you look at that? That's not... He's not gonna be... He's he's gonna have to go back to the store, buy more eggs. You know, so it's it's not just oh whoops I dropped something I'll just pick it back up and walk over you know yeah you know he's he doesn't he seems non threatening you know the part time magician uh, you know dropped his hat and the the ah what's the word yeah you know he's he seems so clumsy you know Finn's a good kid he wants to help. And the, you know, basically the grabber uses the balloons as cover and sprays foam in his face, which is in the short story as well. And Finny draws blood from the, the grabber's arm, also right out of the story. And, and just this thing of, like, some of the time the grabber has this, like, childlike, like, you know, he, he kidnaps him and then he says, I was just kidding about saying that I snapped your neck, you know, it's just, I'm not gonna make you do something that you're not gonna enjoy. Do you want a soda? I'm gonna get you a soda. And see. yeah, the scene where he tells him to hang up the phone, very tense. Absolutely loved it. I really appreciate, like, you know, Bruce and Robin were both. I don't appreciate that they were kidnapped, but I appreciate that the movie made, you know, made sure that we got to know them before they were. You know, so many horror movies, which is kind of, some, some of the victims are just disposable. They're there to get hurt so that later, like, other, ah, uh, what's the word? Like, they're, you know, they're there to dis demonstrate to the audience and or other characters a threat. And yeah, like, here... Like, she also we never learned that much about Donna. We don't get to know the bullies, other than the one that died, or was murdered, rather. And the cops, and the grabber. Other than that, we, you know, the characters we meet, we get to know, even if... Some of them were dead before the first time we saw them. You know, I really appreciate that. I, I did not expect that, that, you know, but yeah, through the through the phone calls and these these little bits of just, you know, we don't play baseball here. Just, the, okay. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's, um, yeah. And, and this thing of like, the first thing you lose is remembering your own name. That's scary. That is legitimately, you know, 
I realize it might not sound it at first, but stop to actually think about it. Imagine waking up and not knowing who you are and like struggling, like the, the bit where, you know, because like Finn is like, no, no, no I, I know who you are. This is what your name was. And then I was like, maybe that is, it. yeah, that sounds kind of familiar, you know, just. Yeah. And I thought it was very effective each time we heard the black phone ring. And yeah, Bruce, when the phone tells us the first thing you forget is your name. And Bruce keeps saying, your arm is mint. And then, you know, by the end of the movie, it's changed to Finney's arm is mint. And Bruce's life appears in Gwen's dream, and it's like God damn it, Scott, who gave you permission to to make me feel things for horror movie characters? Jesus Christ. Yeah. It would cause cause like you see you see him as a really little kid. And the parents, you know, the parents throw a ball at him, and he he does hit it. Like even f as a kid, he's he's good at this, you know. So no wonder they encouraged him. So, you know, he he kept doing the the baseball thing, and he did really well. And then one day, you know, black van pulled up, and you know, I I, I do we know? I guess days later he was dead. I I think it's supposed to be days. That they usually last and yeah just you know with with just like his life in super 8 i don't think it took up more than three maybe four minutes of screen time but it worked you know he was he was a human being with like passion and like he had parents that are now miss, you know, now, I mean, until the end of the movie, they don't even know what happened at all. It's just, he disappeared, you know, so, yeah, I, I thought they did a really great job at that. I don't think every horror movie has to make you care about characters, but I do think that a lot of the best horror movies do make you care about at least some of the characters. And Finn digs for several hours, and you know he gets rid of the dirt in the in the toilet, which could not help but think of Prison Break. Although it's possible they got it from the Shawshank Redemption. Both are excellent. Shawshank Redemption's probably more well respected. And yeah, the the grabber gives you know, Finn some food, and does not lock the door, but, you know, the ghosts do, you know, one of, yeah, the, the phone rings and one of the ghosts tells him it's a trap. And, let's see, yeah, we, you know, the ghosts can actually manipulate objects in the basement. And, we see Super 8 for uh, someone before they were kidnapped. I can't tell who that's. Anyway, but yeah, I really appreciate they're not just victims. And I saw some critics say that the escape attempts or like white knuckled tension. Yeah, agreed. And you know, Mr. Shaw tells Gwen that he's afraid that she, like her mother, will eventually commit suicide because of the things she sees. And the cops meet Max, who is obsessed with the case so 
I am just briefly going to go into it here. I I have to admit I hadn't thought of it while watching the movie, but some I think it might have been a commenter on the Vern review, or maybe it was Vern himself. Max Would Max really be allowed to live like the fact that the grabber has two houses doesn't ah what's the word I guess maybe the idea is supposed to be that Max was in one of the two houses and the grabber and Finn were in the other house and Max went from one house to the other. Actually, yeah, never mind. I don't. I, I guess they either the other person didn't realize that or doesn't agree with that version of events. But yeah, I, th I think that works okay. Yeah. The one, one thing I did see though was it seems like if, if the when the grabber says that the the phone in the basement hasn't worked he says since i was a child that implies that he's that this is the that this is his childhood home but max doesn't really act like like for for you know when when you listen to max with the cops it kind of sounds like oh this is just the place that yeah we never do learn his name do we I am going to call him Grabber. I feel like the Grabber is too, like, ugh, calm down. The Grabber, that was his father. He is Greb Jr. He's Greb Jr. And, yeah, you know, Max believes that Greb Jr. lives in a place that he moved into he he doesn't really sound like someone who and it also is like if if he's on coke and he's obsessed with the case wouldn't he be able to figure out that his weird brother is the is the yeah it's just and and the yeah it just it feels out of place especially the cocaine line reveal you know like the cops I guess they're like, okay, whatever. He's not hurting anybody. We don't want the paperwork. Buddy, maybe maybe get rid of the coke before your brother comes home. Okay, because he's probably not going to be the world's biggest fan of that. Now that you're between jobs, out of state. You know, so just, but, yeah, I, honestly, it almost feels like Max, it feels like, Derrickson was close to making the movie, and then suddenly he realized, ah, oh, man, I really loved working with James Ransone. Could I? Yeah, I could, I could give him in a role. I could put him in a role in this movie as well. And he didn't really stop to think about the logic. But yeah, basically, Max is my, my only problem. And, and the... Yeah, it just like him him coming in there and saying, No, it's okay, you're safe and then his brother comes in from behind the yeah. It just was the the it wasn't necessary. I know you're not sleeping. Santa? I almost let you go. And yeah, so the upside down floating body is very creepy. So yeah, the the I wrote several things on the one, but let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so the, let's see. Yeah, 
yeah, the the bit with the the pinball that led into a fight and an arrest, and then like Gwen lucid dreams her way into like she sits in the back of the cop car, which you know just FYI, cops are not big fans of you doing that in real life. Not that the hard way. I'm kidding. They were very gentle. Yeah, that sounds distinctly like a joke about police brutality. I did not mean for that. Let's see. The the yeah, I thought the the combination code were like for the for the lock was very very tense. I love that like you know, if the kid can't remember his own name, I'm sure he can't remember the exact details of the combination either. And, you know, usually he has enough time to, to work. So, yeah, there's three different versions of it, and he just has to try out all three. And he manages, but then the, the noise and the, the dog barking, and he runs out and car, car chases him down. Just, yeah, very, very tense. And, yeah, we realize that Max and Greg Jr. are brothers. I love the scene of Gwen cussing out Jesus. I, I, um, I'm not, I, I can't help myself. What the fuck, Jesus? Seriously, what the fuck? And she goes on about, like, look, you're the one giving me these dreams. You know, for several days, you gave me dreams that were not useful. And last night, I had no dreams whatsoever. You're the one giving me these dreams. You better give me better dreams. Honestly, when she said, like, there, there was this thing of, like, wait... Is the the yeah? At, at one point she says, "You're the one giving me the dreams." Or is you know? For a second I was like, "Is she implying that the devil is the one giving the dream?" Because that's I don't quite know how how that one makes sense. I, I'm not sure the devil has much vested interest in stopping the. Is Greg Jr. also the devil's brother? See, that I could believe. Or, or, yeah. He's not his cousin. That's Kasten Bach. Yeah, I don't throw many jokes in here for my fellow Danes, but occasionally, yeah. I, I think I may already have said it, but yeah, I thought the relationships were t touching between Finn and the ghost kids. And, you know, Robin teaches Finn to, to how to fight. And, you know, we have a long take of the practice and everything. And Gwen found the place, although later we realize, oh, it was across the street. And she calls the cops. I did, like, for... I almost was like, please, don't, don't, don't tell your dad. Don't tell your dad. But then she gets out the little thing from the cops and calls. And she even asks for the, the right, you know, the, the right detective, Detective Wright. And... Yeah, and, you know, it looks like Max is going to be able to save him, but then Ethan asks James a question, and I guess... Yeah, just a real, real brief. So the... As long as you can see my index finger raised, I am going to be spoiling the first Sinister, so you have been warned. At the end of the first Sinister, James Ransone calls Ethan Hawke and tells him, you shouldn't have moved out of the, you know, if you hadn't, 
technically he did call him before, but Ethan Hawke was ignoring the calls. But, you know, yeah, he calls and tells him the, the people only died after moving to another house from the murder house. And then he, Ethan Hawke and his family, other than the daughter, get cut into pieces using an axe, which is where I am really confused by people who are unclear on if Bagul gives the children super strength, but whatever. And yeah, so, you know, maybe this is payback. He's like, oh, you... You 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 think you could call a little earlier, and maybe me and my family would still be in one piece. Let's see how you like an axe. And no more spoilers for Sinister. I thought it was clever with the dog being put on a leash nearby, and then you know after, you know yeah, um, Finn kills the Grab Junior and then distracts the dog with a piece of meat. Just an object to him. And he is a butcher. And I will grant that Finn versus Grab Jr. started out a little bit home alone with the, the you know him falling through like okay so it starts with him using trip wire and then he falls through the floor I am relieved to be able to say that that is where the Home Alone stuff ends. And to be fair, like, how else is, a, you know, this tiny little kid gonna be able to, you know, take out an adult? So, yeah. Well, did I? No, I did not. And the... What on earth was I trying to write here? Oh, right. The ghost kids say goodbye to Grab Jr. And, you know, several of them just say things they said to Finn. You know, Bruce changes to, you know, Finn. Finn's arm is mint. And see. yeah, you know, Finn got out without help from the living. It was the ghosts that. Now, I can understand if some people feel that means that the whole thing with Gwen and her dreams were, was pointless. I disagree. Because at the end of the day, like. You know, we have a brother and a sister, and they're looking out for each other, you know, and 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 the father. So the the you know, when they are apart and all that, you know, the only thing that Finn can do is try to fight to stay alive. And the only thing Gwen can do is try to dream and to share those dreams. Yeah, that's that's what they do then and yeah I, I i i would agree let's see hypothetically let's say that the ending had the you know if 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 either finn didn't escape alive or if gwen got killed then i would think it was a waste to to spend all that time you know but yeah, you know, ultimately she doesn't, ah, uh, what's the word? Hypothetically, if she hadn't had any of the dreams, he would still have been able to get out of there. But the fact that she did fight, you know, I mean, not everything we do for our siblings directly leads to something. You know, sometimes it's just that you're showing you care, you're showing... You mean a lot to me. I am willing to make sacrifices for you. You know, so yeah, I I really th I thought it would have been a huge mistake if 
hypothetically, like, let's say she didn't have the dreams. Let's say that she didn't even appear once he got taken, c caught, nabbed, grabbed, graboid. I, I really think that would have been a, a mistake. And I feel like the, the twist that there were two houses and, you know, across the street from each other, like, it, it works because, like, you know, the, the pinball guy, he was like, you know, this is where it ends. And so, you know, Gwen and we thought that means that that's the house that he, that Finn is being kept in. That's the house that Grab Jr. is. But, you know, the what he meant was that's where I ended up. You know, that's where I was buried. And, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought it worked. It wasn't the kind of twist where it's like, oh, come on. Yeah. yeah. And I really loved, like, when 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 Finn is able to you know, unlock the door and escape to freedom, just the light on his face. You know, it, it looks like he hasn't seen light for a week. It's, it's like, just, yeah. And... You know, and we see in, in school, everyone's talking about Finn and the bullies. Don't hurt him. I saw one compare it to, like, oh, he's like, Teen Wolf, and I don't think I ever watched that movie, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's kind of cliche, you know, and yeah, he, he gets back and he sits next to, you know, it's, it's lab partner time, he sits down next to Donna, and she's like, hello Finn, call me Finn, and Music cue, smash cut, end credits are rolling, because that's it, you know, he has his confidence now, and I've seen some people say that it's disturbing that the movie seems to equate that, you know, oh, you gotta become more confident, so, you know, beat someone bloody, that's, yeah. I do really appreciate that no matter the, like, even once Grab Jr. was, like, stuck down there, he'd broken one of his feet ankles I guess it was and like the the you know yeah Finn keeps hitting him in the head with the you know and and then at one part he actually does manage to grab it and just, I really like that it kept being a challenge kept being an uphill battle and then by the end he manages to choke him with the the foam cord now the let's see the brings us to here we go yeah so ah uh, do I have a lot yeah so the that brings us to the final part of this video notes taken before watching get off the phone you'll use up all my minutes I am waiting for my mommy to call now yeah so I understand why you know some some people found it very frustrating that Ethan Hawke I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, he does not have that much screen time. Um, I, th I, th I saw someone saying, you know, he receives the and credit. And, yeah, it's true. He's, he's really not in this very much. Certainly today, some horror movies will have the threat show up a lot. But a lot of the best horror movies don't show the threat all that much because there is some risk we'll get used to him. There are slasher series that start out not showing the threat very much, but over the course of them, get to show them more and more. And it's also like, how many movies can you do where you hide the the threat if it's in the same series? After a while, people are going to be like, okay, we get it. You're playing coy. Get on with it. You know. So, I I, I didn't think I I thought they did an 
the I thought they had him in the right amount. The the he, I, I never became used to him. I never felt like I knew exactly what he was going to say or do. What personality we were getting. Now, let's see. Yeah, so quoting a few fellow critics, the calls from the ghost children are especially effective when we see them in the room with Finn. One of the scariest parts is one of the escape attempts. And... Yeah, you know, I thought it was a great, uh, great hook concept based on the trailer. You know, you have this teenager kidnapped, right? I thought it was one of his friends, not his sister, having nightmares that provide clues on where he is. And the teenager himself gets clues on how to escape via the phone, which is normally broken. But he can hear things from beyond the grave, the other kids, the kidnapper kidnapped. And it really is, like, by the end, he managed to use everything, you know, he used the fact that he started to dig a hole. He used the fact that he tore down the the covering thing from from the window. You know that I'm pretty sure that was what was at the bottom of the of the foley thing. Yeah, and the the wire that he used to trip. I think that was the one he used that he accidentally tore the the thing down. And he used the meat from the the broken freezer. For the, to, to distract the dog, and, you know, yeah, he got the phone off the hook and hit with, you know, put, put dirt from the hole in it. Wait, there's no dirt in the hole, it's a hole. Well, whatever. And, let's see. Yeah, and in interview, in an interview, Ethan Hawke talks about trying to figure out what the background of his character is, why he hurts people, since the movie doesn't, and uh, I forget if this was C. Robert Cargill or Scott Derrickson, but one of the writers said, we never think of the grabber as anything other than a monster, and hey, you can tell, and that was the right way to go. I, I, I don't know if I can completely communicate to you how awful I think it would have been if the movie ended with like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can, I can just see it now. Let me paint you a picture. You know, one of the cops comes in, pulls the mask off. It's the O'Grady kid, you know, when his father, and just go into this monologue that explains every single trait of the, you know, oh, you know, he was kept down in the basement. That's why he would keep other children down there. And when he was caught by his father, he would get beaten. So that's why he would try to catch the kids and beat them and all this stuff. Just we don't we shouldn't know it. You know, and Scott Derrickson clearly appreciate that you can create something extremely scary just by changing the human face just a little in the right way. Bagul from Sinister. What on earth? Nah, okay. Whatever you say. Bagul from Sinister. And the grabber from this, and I can imagine in the exorcism of Emily Rose, the possessed girl. Well, I'm not really sure what she's called. But yeah, you know, if you, uh, hmm, I don't want to give it away for people who haven't watched Sinister. Let's just go with. No, you know what? Never mind. I'm gonna spoilers for the Sinister movies. While un until I lower my index finger again, with Bagul, like the mouth is just gone. It doesn't look like oh he just doesn't open his mouth. No, 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 there is no mouth. Maybe there never was. Let's see. I think you can get an idea of eyes, but you can't see eyes as such. There's basically like 
a dark space there, and like he'll moves his head, he moves his head, and you you feel like oh I can I, I can see the eyes and they're staring right at me, but you can't. And no more spoilers for the Sinister movies. And you know in this like his face is never completely covered. I guess he never. I'm not sure he ever covers his eyes at all. But you know sometimes it's just the you know it's an it's an unhappy mouth. Sometimes it's mouth covered. Sometimes the lower half of his face is completely uncovered. And, you know, there's that bit where you can see he's been crying. And just, yeah. Scott Derrickson evidently also likes horror movies where the targets are children or teenagers. And it's no wonder why. Fundamentally, they are more vulnerable than the average adult. Because at the end of the day... There's going to be a lot of people who will never listen to what they say just because of their age. And for those of us who can remember what it was like to be a child or teenager, it did legitimately feel like we basically existed at the whims of other people. When you're too little to buy your own food or cook it, there simply isn't any way for you to get food if the people who are supposed to make sure you get food, you know, parents, legal guardians, the school, refuse. And that's just one of many examples. In an interview, Scott details that apparently producer Jason Bloom of Bloomhouse had a guy install a black phone in his new basement, and the way that Scott found out about this was because he called it late at night. So evidently he likes scaring the crap out of people in real life, not only in movies. And the uh, Mason Tam Thames who plays Finn, said in interview that he could actually hear the voices of the ghost kids on the other side of the phone, and it helped his performance, and I believe it. And, see, yeah, by the end of the movie, we still know very little about the Grabber, because ultimately, anything we find out about his background is only going to, if not humanize him, help explain the horror, and a lot of horror it's just much more effective the less it's explained. I don't know for sure if the writer-director duo are fans of John Carpenter and especially his original Halloween movie, but I could imagine. Certainly the camera treats Sinister's Bagul in a way very similar to how Dean Cundy's cinematography treats Michael Myers. They're in the frame, sure, but you're not quite sure what they're going to do. How does this relate to the Grabber? John Carpenter is on the record as saying that one of his goals with the original Halloween movie, which is one of the reasons that I'm sure that Rob Zombie is, I, I can imagine he's a great guy in real life, and he definitely knows how to make movies, and I wouldn't rule. I, I think there's some chance that if I watched The House of a Thousand Corpses, I might really love the movie. But I really don't think he understands how to deal with Mike Myers. Anyway, John Carpenter said one of his goals with the original Halloween movie was to create in Michael Myers a character that it was impossible to relate to. And Scott Derrickson and Robert Cargill have done the same with The Grabber and The Ghoul. All we know about the Grabber is that he's a serial abductor and murderer of children. With the stereotypical panel land, which, you know, today if you come up, if you come with a panel land and you start talking to children, everyone's going to be like, that's the kidnapper, M mystery solved. But back then, that was, you know, yeah. And, yeah, stereotypical panel land posing as a children's entertainer who will at first lower the child's guard by seeming clumsy appealing to them with the entertainment stuff in no way is this enough to understand why he does what he does where he came from what happened to him to make him this way or did he just snap or something else entirely we'll never know and that's exactly how it should be It is legitimately a horrifying situation to find yourself in, you know, this basement with nothing but an old black phone and a disgusting toilet, and then it starts ringing, the phone, not the toilet, that would have been even weirder. 
And yeah, so I'm just briefly going to talk about it. So the, the short story opens with the kidnapping of Finn. And yeah, so the grabber is morbidly obese, which I really appreciate that they didn't make Ethan Hawke wear a fat suit or like for sure there's like you could find some some heavy set actors who could pull off the the creepy act but i i yeah i don't know why i i keep making videos that adapt stories from the written medium where one of the characters was like morbidly obese like it was the uh, uh what's it called Ah, uh, pr primal fear, the the oh, vicar or priest, what whatever it is exactly is the the yeah, who is you know who who dies very early. In the book, he's described as morbidly obese, and I'm almost one hundred percent certain he isn't in the movie. So yeah, anyway. But yeah, the the clumsiness is in the short story, and yeah. You know, he shoots Finny's, Finn's face with foam that makes him throw up. It's painful. He can barely see anything. He resists even biting the man in the arm until he draws blood. And the grabber calls himself Al and tries to talk Finn down after the fight. And Al seems upset that the phone rings, relieved when he realizes it's not the black phone, but the upstairs phone. And we're told that a while passes without the grabber kidnapping anyone, and Finny turned... 13. The grabber only grabbed those as old as 12, so Finny thought he was safe. Al knew Finny's name, which shocked him. And yeah, so the ending is Finny got the receiver off the phone, chewing through the wire, hit it, waited for the right time, smashed Al in the face repeatedly, then he wrapped the wire around Al's neck until he dies, and that's the ending. There's nothing after that. And yeah, you know. I think the only thing in the short story is Finn in the, you know, being kidnapped, being in the basement, the, the phone rings, ghost children, and then he kills the, the grabber, and then the book, you know, then the short story ends. So everything else was added for the movie. I think, I think Grace is mentioned in the book, and she's like looking for him, but I don't think if, ah, it's been several days, so it's possible. Yeah, it's possible that Gwen did have dreams that led her to, you know, but, but yeah, in, in the short story, Gwen, uh, Finn saves himself. He doesn't need, he does, uh, the help from the living doesn't really speed things up. And yeah, I, I think they did a really great job on, you know, it's the kind of thing like, uh, I I can't I cannot tell you how glad I am that Derrickson didn't just like read that and say oh well I guess we just gotta go with that just make like ninety minute movie that starts with a kid getting kidnapped and ends with him killing the the kidnapper and escaping so just you know that would that would have been incredibly as it is I never felt it spent too long on any one thing like if I had to guess I wouldn't rule out that almost a third of this movie passes before Finn is kidnapped the other you know a couple of the others are kidnapped but I was never bored now the let's see Right, so yeah, I, I had a little bit more to say about the dreams. The fact that, you know, the, the movie ends with the, the you know, ba yeah, basically Mr. Shaw realizes that he's been, you know, yeah, the way he's been treating his children is not okay. And, you know, he begs for their forgiveness and he's, you know, the last thing we see is him on his knees and the the two kids holding each other not like you know so yeah like it's basically like things are gonna have to change if you know or 
yeah, you know, the, not all is forgiven just because you apologize, just because you beg forgiveness. And it is this thing of like, I mean, at the end of the day, parents are always going, even, even parents who aren't abusive, you know, there's going to be some issue with, there's going to be something that they think that they should do or shouldn't do that their parents have the exact opposite opinion on. And yeah, you know, part of growing up is asserting yourself not to the point where you alienate your family, you know, so yeah, you know, by the end it is like, you know, Finn has more self-confidence and the kids are going to expect more of Mr. Shaw now. And it, yeah, like, so yeah, all, like we, the viewer, realize that technically Gwen's visions didn't actually make, come to think of it, did they maybe make it a little bit, make it happen a little bit quicker with the, because, because when he comes down, and is about to attack. Yeah, when when Grab Jr. comes down and is about to attack Finn that last time, it's because he thinks that the the cops are gonna be there any minute, and he just wants to kill him before he. No, wait, no, because he says he's gonna take his time. Yeah, ultimately, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, Please correct me in the comments if I if I missed something. But but yeah. Anyway, it's possible that Gwen's visions didn't mean that Finn got out sooner. But nobody has to tell Mr. Shaw that. It's okay for him to believe that the thing that he used to be mad at her for is actually something that saved his life. You know, and yeah, like the the. Yeah, I, I don't know. I it it worked in my opinion and yeah, if if, if Scott Derrickson and see Robert Cargill and Ethan Hawke, pretty please would be up for more, I'd be perfectly happy to to see more like Sinister didn't even really have that much of a Stephen King thing really, did they? That was more like like there were some some traits for sure but you know yeah but but the yeah did i already say i was very relieved that the ghost kids never came off as goofy in this which they they did in both of the sinister movies and just yeah i don't uh, yeah that oh actually did I mention all the ghost kids give excellent performances I guess I didn't say that in the review part because I didn't want to give too much away or maybe I just forgot could be either could go either way on this one but yeah the the um, I believe that's everything so yeah um, I really hope that Scott Derrickson doesn't wait so long until the next I mean, if if it's like Doctor Strange 3, Scott, I absolutely love your work on the first Doctor Strange, and for sure, in some ways, it is better than the second movie, but Sam Raimi is perfect for Doctor Strange, so that really, like, yeah, it's just, yeah. I I I hope to see more and I hope I don't have to wait an entire decade for more. Yeah, but I do believe that is absolutely everything that I have to say. So I have a sign off here. There we go. So yeah, please hit me up in the comments. Tell me what is your favorite 
horror movie, favorite horror movie of like recent years. Do you think there the this movie should have been different? Are you hoping to, you know Scott Derrickson tries to put out a Sinister Three, or should he stick with you know should should he make another original thing like how you know with both Deliver Us from Evil and this he did something different from Sinister? If you like this video, please. Thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists. A suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Ms. Marvel. And Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're not. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.